The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, welcome everybody. Coffee with Kalefi. Thanks for joining us today. And that's also thanks for your support of Kalefi. We appreciate each and every one of you. And uh, input's always welcome. You know, we love hearing from you. Whatever we can do to help you out or make our presentations better, let us know. So thanks. Um, this is going to be kind of fun today. Like I say, it's our 100th uh, version of the webinar. So we thought we'd kind of do something kind of fun and different today. So see what you think as we go along here. <clears throat> The hydronics journals, I hope everybody that's tuned in today is getting these. These are free. We send them out uh, twice a year. The next one will be out in July here. You can get back issues. They're also available on our website as a PDF. So if there's an issue out there that you want to, you know, use some of the information out for some of your own training or something like that, we make these really uh, accessible for you to use. But they're also good collector's item. They're all pre-punched. They'll fit in the binder. Uh, and when I go to engineering offices, I love seeing these hydronic issues on their shelves. It's just uh, uh, proves to us that these are being used and that you guys do, the guys and gals do appreciate us uh, cranking this out there. Today, it was hard to pick just one issue that really uh, wraps up everything we're going to be talking about today, but I think the closest one I could find is number 19. And what we did on this, this is a couple issues back, is um, we took six of probably the most common questions we get or, or piping diagrams we see that have little glitches into them. And we talked about that. So you'll see a drawing in those with a big X through it, like don't do it this way. This was the mistake that was made or this is um, you know, what didn't work properly on that. And then we talk about the, the best way to correct that. So um, that's the issue that I think really uh, talks pretty much about every drawing and picture that I'm gonna show you today. Now keep in mind as I show these, you know, I could ask everyone that's tuned in today to go out there and design and or install a job and every one of you could do it a little bit differently and that doesn't mean that, you know, one is wrong or that one's better than the other. Uh, you know, you might look at this drawing and say, well, I would have used a 90 and a 45 there instead of two 90s or something like that. So that's not what we're trying to, you know, to uh, analyze or look at here. We're just trying to show how these jobs were put together, the different type of materials they use. For example, the uh, the PE tubing, the aquatherm tubing used on this job, uh, how they put the co uh, components together, their selection of components and stuff like that. And um, that's our intention here. It's not to you know, look at a, a piping schematic and say, well, I, I could have put that in a two feet less. So this is one that came into us from our, our friends up in Canada. This is a poultry barn. I think it's about a, what was it? I got my notes here, about a, it's actually a 26,000 square foot poultry barn. Uh, has multiple boilers there. I think those are 399 boilers, a row of boilers, <clears throat> and they feed a, a bunch of air handlers in the various parts of this poultry barn. Uh, every one of the air handlers has one of our 132 quick setter balancing valves on it, so they are able to go around and the installer was able to go around and balance the system without having to uh, come back with a meter. So let me see if this pointer is visible for everybody here. So a couple of things I'll point out as we go here. I like the way that he's, uh, you know, put the pipe uh, pumps below every boiler. He's got isolation there. You can see that up on the top, he's got additional air vents on the top of the boiler. So those are high point vents. In addition to the, the air removal that you're going to get from our hydro separator here, you also have these vents uh, on the top of every boiler. A lot of the boiler manufacturers um, will send that vent along with it and show you, a, you know, a picture or drawing of how to put that in with a T like that. I also like that he used all brass components here, so you won't get any rust or um, corrosion or anything going up into that vent and causing problems there. And of course, you can see he's taking his pressure relief valve and pipe that down to the um, down behind the boilers, down to the floor. The other thing in this picture right here that I really like is that he's put this little uh, check sheet. It's got his company name on there, all his contact information. But on a sheet like this or a little sticker like this, you could um, put notes on there. Like if you put a chemical in this system, uh, maybe make a note of what, maybe put Romar or something in there, the date that you put it in there, the number of the product that you put in there. So if down the road, another contractor or a troubleshooter comes to work on the system someday, he's got a, um, a pretty good track record of what's been done on that system when it was installed, um, what type of fluid might have been put into it. So um, he doesn't have to start over and uh, repeat some of the work that's already been done. And then what else can I talk about over here? You can see the... Uh, by using this aquatherm piping, we've got the, uh, our larger hydrocephalus like this come in a flange version. So all he had to do here was get a companion flange and then he could go right to that fusion weld pipe. So it made a really quick and clean connection to get into that. I've also seen, in fact, it might be in some of the other pictures coming up where they'll put uh, isolation valves in here, put like a butterfly or a wafer valve in there. So if you did want to isolate this off for whatever reason and maybe add into the system someday or something like that, uh, that can be done. Now he's got isolation, of course, at the boiler, but I've seen it where they've isolated all four of these separators too, but 
that's a, a really nice piping job. We like seeing this. We like seeing these big jobs where they can uh, use the big hydro separators and get the multifunction. I mean, really, that's the key to, you know, as I went through the slides, I had a hard time finding any of the pictures that have been sent into us at, a, what, four or five years now that um, had primary secondary piping. I think the next slide shows one example of it. But that tells us that a lot of the industry is embracing the hydro separators. I know a lot of the boiler manufacturers are showing this as a piping option in their installation manuals. So um, I think people are realizing that it's nice to have the four functions in one device. If you've got the magnetic version of this, you've got magnetic separation, air and dirt separation, as well as your four port connection for your for your hydraulic separation. So it's a it's a real space and time saver. So. Here's an example. Thanks to the guys from PSI out in uh, Avon, Colorado for sending this in. This was a uh, convention center job that had a big uh, 2 million BTU boiler in it that was starting to go and the efficiency was uh, starting to affect the pocketbooks there a little bit. So they went in and replaced that 2 million with a couple uh, 725,000 condensing boilers and got it up and going just in time for the snowfall. Uh, fin tube and fan coils on this job. But here's exactly what we talk about when we talk about primary, secondary where you just take the boiler and tee it into this primary loop with two closely spaced tees here. It looks like that's some Victrolic fittings there. That's probably a, a roll groove job on the, uh, the piping that was in the building. And then they just uh, you know, transitioned the copper to, to tie into the multiple uh, boilers here. But what you'll see in this picture is he's done a good job. So he's got the, um, the dirt separator here. He's got his primary secondary and somewhere in the picture, there's probably an air separator in there. So here's a classic example where we could have put one device on this job or a, a dual device. We could have put in a combination air and dirt separator here, or we could have used a hydro separator and taken pretty much everything in this picture out, taking the closely spaced tees out, the primary secondary piping would be done via the hydro separator. We would have got the dirt removal and we would have got air removal. So um, I think in this case, this was probably the best and quickest way to get into that job because they were under the gun here for timing to get this thing replaced. and. Uh, not have that building down for too long a period of time. So you can see where they just split into the uh, primary loop here and uh, put the two T's in there and, and use the primary second. It works fine. I mean, this is an option in all the piping uh, drawings that you'll see from the manufacturers. We'll see this primary secondary shown as a, the proper way to pipe this type of boiler to ensure that it gets uh, adequate flow and we're hydraulically isolated the primary loop from the secondary loop with this uh, closely spaced T's here. Hey, Bob, before we go to the next slide, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I heard your, your voice coming in, so go ahead. Okay, maybe we'll do a poll on hydraulic separation for the audience here and just get a, a pulse on uh, their practices today between uh, using uh, hydraulic separator devices versus using, as you see on the photograph here, closely spaced tees. So let me launch this poll and just see what the folks see, uh, are saying out there. All right, that's good to get some feedback and we've got this many people, okay. a captive audience. Okay, so the question is for primary secondary piping, when do you use a hydraulic separator instead of closely spaced T's? Do you almost always use a hydraulic separator when you want primary, primary secondary versus closely spaced? Most of the time, some of the time, or seldom? You can pick one answer, what best um, matches your practices, either as a designer or as a uh, installer out there. Okay, so 28% some of the time, 20, um, I can't read it, I think 25%, most of the time, 20 some percent, almost always, and then 24, it's pretty much evenly split. Yeah, uh, you can't is. see the screen, but it's pretty much right down the middle, uh, evenly split between those four different uh, options or practices. So very good. That's interesting. I would have thought there'd be a clear winner there. So yeah, well, thanks for the uh, feedback from everybody that uh, participated there. So, so here's what I did. I thought this was a, a good idea. See what you think. I took a slide of a uh, one of the jobs that you sent in for the Cleppy Excellence. And what I did here is I credited the people that sent this to us, both the designer and if you did include the installer, I put both names on there. And also what I did, so if you want to go back to our, our website, I put the CE, which is Cleffy Excellence. This is the, the date that they entered this. So uh, February of 2015 is when this was sent in. So 
if you want to go to our website and you want to get more information on this job, most of these entries had multiple pictures. Obviously, it's hard to cram too many pictures of a slide like that, but um, I'll try and talk about each one of these and give you a little information. But if you do want to go back uh, to our site there and look and get some more pictures and see, you know, the rest of this piping or some more explanation on it. Now, the other thing that I did is I also put the hydronics that I'm thinking or hoping that this uh, installer and this designer, I know Daryl up there, might have used uh, when he decided to use a buffer tank on this job because that's what we're showing here is he's got a boiler with multiple zones as you can see by the manifolds and he's piped it to a buffer tank and we did an hydronics issue a couple years ago uh, number 17 on buffer tanks and you can see this picture looks a lot like what's in this drawing here one of the drawings that's inside the hydronics so that's what i'm trying to tie together here is the hydronics that fits the picture and then also uh, where you can go and get more information on it but what i'm going to try and do is just take a minute or two on each one of these slides and just kind of walk through here and point out some of the things that uh, I think are interesting and I think uh, uh, would be good information to share. The buffer tank, so basically what he's doing is he's piping right out of the boiler into the buffer tank. So that gives them a little bit more uh, mass to the system, a little bit more capacity, so to speak. So this becomes sort of a, a, a thermal battery, if you will, stores a little bit of the energy. So if, for example, he's got just one of these zones kicking on, if this is zoned with uh, actuators or zone valves out in the, uh, further out in the system, you can see the zone valves up here, you won't short cycle the boiler. So that's really what we're trying to do. If this boiler can't modulate down to the lowest um, flow rate required for if just one of these manifolds or one of these zones is open, you're going to get excessive cycling. So the buffer tank just gives us a little bit more capacity in the system to try and minimize the uh, on and off cycling of that boiler. So since you've got this, it becomes a multiple function device, the buffer tank. So now you've got the hydraulic separation between your boiler and your distribution over here. Uh, you also have an air elimination point because this is a dome top inside of our tanks here. So that's a great place to grab air because what we know about a buffer tank is it's a real low velocity zone. As the flow goes into here, it, let's say, I don't know, let's pick a number, 10 gallons a minute, and it goes into those big uh, inch and a half or two inch connection ports on the side of this tank and it goes into this big space, it slows down. And that's a great way to get air out. If you can slow the velocity of that fluid going in and out of this tank, then it becomes a, uh, a giant air separator, basically. I also like that he put a gauge up here. And from what I can see, it looks like it might be a multiple gauge, like a pressure and temperature gauge. So that becomes a good place. It's about the only gauge I see in this picture to know where this, um, you know, the static fill pressure is on our system. It's a good place to at a glance, see if he's got a leak. If for some reason that pressure go da goes down, he knows that uh, there could be a leak in the system. So, and the temperature, of course, it'll give you a good indication of what's being stored in that tank and what's available out to the, um, the multiple zones. You can see this is a uh, EMC type of pump. It looks like a Grunfoss Alpha, pump, which is a great pump when you're going to zone with valves like that. That pump can modulate based on the uh, on the load requirements as multiple zone valves start opening and closing here. That pump is going to match its output to the demand on the system all the time. And by having the buffer tank there as a hydraulic separator, it doesn't matter if we're pulling two gallons a minute out of this system out to the zones or if all these zones are open and maybe we're going as high as 10 or 12 gallons a minute. That pump's going to modulate, and by having the buffer tank as our separator, we won't be affecting the flow going through the boiler. So it's, it really makes a nice combination here. And by using our stubby version of our, our thermocon there, it fits right under the boiler here. So it didn't take a lot of real estate in that room to get a really nice system that's buffered. It's got the uh, modulation. It's got the variable speed pumping and also the um, <clears throat> there and dirt separation. Now, also notice that the... These may transition to PEX tubing here. We do on some of our valves have adapters now that you could go right off that valve with a PEX tailpiece on it. So we've got uh, tailpieces that you can sweat, you can press, you can thread, or it has a PEX insert like that. So that wouldn't take an additional fitting to come off that valve to go to the uh, PEX run out to the manifold. So that's something new that maybe some of you didn't realize that we offer that uh, in all those different types of connections for a bunch of our different valves pretty much any one of our valves be it a zone valve or a mixing valve a balancing valve that has a one inch g thread on it g for gas thread it's just a straight thread you can now choose different types of tail pieces for the connections that you know you like in fact you can mix and match you could have a thread on one end of this valve and a press on the other so then you don't have to make any uh on the job uh, transition fittings it's all built right into the uh the tailpiece that you buy from us. Uh, what else can I tell you about this? Nice piping. Um, 
a nice tight application. Now it does look like he's got an additional air separator up here. That's not a bad idea. There's no harm in having more than one place to get air. Knowing that this isn't a micro bubble type of air separation device, it looks like up here he's got one in the piping also. And that's uh, that'll get any little micro bubbles that are in the system as you start up or it starts up every phone in the heating mode. So I might have gone too long on that one, <laughs> too many minutes on that one. What I wanted to show, and that was one of the uh, teasers I know that we had in the in the promotion for this webinar, is small footprint jobs where you've got just a small mechanical closet, or you're trying to get everything in one uh, you know room, maybe under a staircase or in a small mechanical room. Because even on the biggest homes that we see out there, seven, eight, ten, twelve thousand square foot homes, they still give you the smallest possible space to put all this equipment in. So. Here's an example where the hydro separator really helps in that application. Look how close you were able to get that indirect tank to that boiler by using the hydro separator and have to do, instead of having to do a primary secondary, we'd have to do a loop in and out of this boiler, have the closely spaced T's, have the additional pump going over to that. So this really cleans up um, the piping. It makes it so you can really squeeze the components tight together like that. There are no minimum, you know, uh, distances in and out of this thing so you could have an elbow right at that it's still going to do air separation even if you were to you know close couple that with elbows coming right out of the both sides that unlike some of the air scoops out there where you've got to have 18 inches of piping dimension before you go into them to get your good air separation um, with the uh, set for our separators with the media that we put inside there now you can close couple to them uh, you could have a pump bump right against that connection also to uh, pump right out of it and that would still do a good job of air and dirt removal we're seeing more and more of the uh, poly venting on that. You can see there's an example of that. Um, what else can I show you here? Doesn't look like he's used ECM pumping on either of these. Those look like just uh, basic uh, fixed speed pumps, but uh, uh, press fittings, that's another thing that you'll see in some of the jobs as we go through there. Uh, we do have fittings to adapt directly from our components to press now that you don't have to have another transition fitting between the, uh, the cloppy component if you want to go to press. I thought probably the best uh, hydronics to refer to here would be 11 because there is some uh, um, mixing valve on the domestic water. So we talk about that, especially if you're going to put a domestic water recirculation pump, which I don't know if there's a recirculation pump in there. <clears throat> and then also the uh, hydraulic separation. Now, what you'll see as we go through there, we actually did a couple issues on hydraulic separation. One of our first issues that we came out with was on hydraulic separation but over the years we've improved the products we've got more products that we offer for that so uh, what we do is uh, we'll come out with an updated version of hydronics that will talk about the new products that we've added and some of the new technologies that we see out there so on some of these slides you'll notice I look at a, an older issue one or two as well as a, an updated version of it in this case uh, issue number 15 we did hydraulic separation again Hey, Bob, yep. uh, before you leave this slide, uh, the, the fill valve up above the hydraulic separator, you can see uh, he's uh, slanted it probably to allow some clearance yep. from that pipe above and to actually get access to the uh, pressure dial. Yep. Um, you might want to talk about that diaphragm and, and the importance of orientating. So it, it, it's orientation um, capability in terms of how to position yeah. it. Yeah, what we don't want to do when you, it should hold true for any pressure reducing valve is you wouldn't want to have this facing down like this because then any dirt or debris that would set on that diaphragm, then as that diaphragm moves up and down, you've got a little wear point there. And the same thing for a backflow preventer, there's one position, and I don't know if Kevin's on there or not, I think you can put this vertically, but it depends on the flow direction going through it. I think if the flow direction is going up, this can be mounted vertically, but you can't put the backflow preventer, at least this backflow preventer, uh, vertically if you're flowing down for the same reason that we can trap uh, against those uh, check valves in there. So I guess the key to that is always read the directions, the installation information. I think as Mark said, this one's tipped out a little bit just so that could be serviced because you can see there's a pipe above it. So if ever you wanted to get in there and uh, you know clean out the strainer that's around that cartridge or replace it if it uh, ever went bad. It yeah, and that's fine, that's fine. You could so. even uh, I've tilted it sideways, which is okay, but just not yeah. upside down. Yeah, not upside down is what we're saying. Um, the other thing I was going to say about that, I, it's hard to tell in this picture, but we'd like to see you guys put a vent pipe out of this uh, backflow preventer vent port down to the floor here, because someday if something gets stuck in those uh, check valves, this thing could dribble a little bit of water out, and we certainly don't want it dribbling down across all this equipment. So 
Uh, that's, that's the reason we give you a threaded port there. It's not to put a plug in someday if it leaks, it's to put a drain tube uh, down to where it, uh, it could drip someday if, uh, if it failed and not cause any problems. So it might be in that picture. I'm not saying it's not, but it's, it's not clear to me from that drawing if, I, if it's in there. But uh, thanks to Rob for sending this in. And uh, this was a replacement job uh, out in Colorado. <laughs> Uh, another, I guess I would call this another tight space job here. What's a little bit different about this job is this is a job that's being zoned with zone pumps. Um, this is from our friends up in Canada, another nicely piped system. Um, you can see the hydraulic separator banged up real tight across uh, to that NTI boiler, uh, low water cutoff switch there, uh, pressure relief valve there, pipe down to the floor. So if that ever spits, it doesn't spit on the equipment. It looks like that pipe right there probably goes to that pressure relief valve. Um, Expansion tank, you know, there's controversy out there. Can a tank uh, be mounted upside down like this? Some people say, no, the nipple should always be up. I'll tell you, I went to the Amtrol site recently and they don't say that this is not, uh, uh, isn't one of the ways that you can mount it. So you'll see as we go through these pictures, some of them with uh, the connection to the tank are up. Some are actually mounted sideways with the connection out either right or left-hand side. And some of them are mounted like this with the, uh, with the tap facing down. You can see he's got kind of a, a little trap in here. He's got also an isolation valve there, which is a good idea. So there shouldn't be uh, an issue with any dirt or debris getting in there where it could rub against that diaphragm. Notice also that this has a, uh, a fill system on it. So maybe it's a glycol system. We are seeing more and more of these, uh, these little fill tanks where you can mix your chemicals or mix your glycol in there. And that maintains the, uh, uh, via that pressure reducing valve, maintains the system fill pressure in there and also the low water cutoff switch there. If there is a leak in the system and you do run out of fluid in your fill tank, uh, he's got protection up there, a second level of protection for uh, uh, preventing that boiler from firing with no water in it or under a low fluid condition. Or right, anything else I can show you there? I think that's pretty good. Uh, nicely piped, nicely mounted isolation valves on the pump and stuff so that can be serviced down the road. This one here, I like it. Uh, again, another job with a uh, looks like Aquatherm brand piping. Um, in this job, he's got a um, a bigger magna. This is one of Grunfoss magna pumps, a little bit higher output pump than the uh, the Alpha pump. So you can see he's got quite a few zone circuits on this job here. He's got some valves over here on this wall. It's here. So I don't know if he gave me a total how many valves. This was a medical clinic, so. This was another retrofit job where they never had good control over all the different rooms in this clinic. So this uh, installer there went in and designed a system that gave them the ability to zone every one of the rooms in this, uh, in this little clinic here. So it gave them much better heat control. And by using the variable speed ECM pump, um, as these zone valves toggle open and close, um, that pump is gonna speed up and match the output that's required by the job. And again, that's all possible because he's got the hydraulic separator here. So uh, you might have one gallon a minute going out here under some conditions, and you might have, if all these zone valves are open, you could have as much as 20 or 25 gallons per minute. And it's not gonna affect the flow in these boilers over here because it's isolated with the, uh, the separator here, giving them the function of the, uh, uh, this is a SEP4. So he's got air removal on the top. He's got dirt removal. There's a magnetic band around the bottom of this for uh, magnetic separation for magnetite or anything that might be in the system. And then also the um, hydraulic separation with the four port. I mean, if you guys look at the hydraulic separator, really it's primary, secondary in a box. When you look at it and you turn it on its side, there's your closely spaced teeds. We just make it convenient and, and put four of them in there. So you've got both your primary and secondary piping uh, all built into the box for you. I put this issue in there. This is one we did a number of years ago on zoning. I don't know if anybody's had a chance to look at that, but we just give you some good pointers and tips about zoning and probably one of the best takeaways from this hydronics issue is when you zone and you use multiple zone valves, we like to think anytime you put more than four zone valves in a system, you should really be looking at using one of these delta P type of pumps that can vary its output or have a pressure a bypass valve piped either somewhere after the pump here or at the end of it. So that if you have a fixed speed pump as zones open and closed, uh, we make a bypass valve that could be piped in there. This is, I think, the best way to do it because you're going to have the ability to that pump to modulate, but also you get the uh, uh, less power consumption with that ECM type of motor. Yeah, Bob, I was going to say, you know, some might argue that uh, a permanent split capacitor type uh, pump would be okay if it has a very flat, you know, curve, uh, um, head curve. Uh, yeah. But but then again, you're going to 
going to consume much more uh, energy than a, an ECM pump. Exactly. Now here's a product that uh, we make and we don't see a lot of these out there. This is what we call a HydroLink. And what this device does here, it's a hydro separator built right into the end of it here. You can see the boiler connection, but it's also the distribution manifold. So it's kind of a hydro separator with the additional ports to mount your uh, pumps or your mixing stations right onto it. So uh, a little bit of air removal here, although I do like that he put an additional air removal device here because this chamber isn't very big in here. We don't get a lot of um, air removal that you would from a you know a micro bubble type of a air removal device here and then what this allows you to do with now we've got um, a newer version of this you can actually put our mixing stations and bolt them right onto these connections so you can see what they've done here is he's got um, three different temperature uh, going out to the job so actually four if you count this one on the bottom that isn't mixing so uh, he's got uh, different types of distribution He's got some panel radiators, some uh, radiant in slab. So every one of these can be adjusted to the temperature that that circuit requires, whether it's a fin tube or a panel radiator or a radiant uh, slab type of job. So um, it's a good way, again, to uh, it's a space saver. So instead of doing the primary, secondary piping and have to make all these close T's, you would have to pipe every one of these set of T's into a, a primary loop here next to that boiler. that would have taken uh, a lot more fittings and a lot more time to do it. So that's really where the HydroLink fits. Um, limited to about 100, 110,000 BTU jobs because of the, uh, you know, the size of the piping that we build into this um, HydroLink here. But it is a nice little uh, problem solvers for jobs like this where you want to do a lot of mixing and you have, again, a tight space to, to get everything into. Uh, expansion tank hanging off a nice bracket here. Additional uh, air vent at the high point there. Pressure pressure gauge up there, gauge up there for there for system. Yeah, I like this. I got to keep moving here, Mark. And I thought I was going to have not enough slides. And here I am looking at my screen thinking, how am I going to pull this off? So um, <clears throat> another new home installation here, uh, a dual boilers, outdoor reset. Uh, you can see a smart indirect tank here. I like this one because it shows our, some of our wiring components. So there's our zone valves and there's some of the cluffy relay boxes. So we've got boxes that can run uh, various pumps under different conditions. You can select the priority of these pumps. Uh, especially when you have an indirect tank, if you want to make sure that when there's a call for indirect that we drop off the uh, the distribution going out to the heating system, we can do that right in our box, has the uh, the capacity to select the uh, the way that you want to prior prioritize the status of which pumps come on when. So it really makes a good match for with our Z1 valve with our, our relay boxes because it does give you so much uh, flexibility on the way that you can uh, call these pumps on and off. And hey, here's Bob, another example. Hey, yep. Go ahead. Uh, a question came in, uh, I shared, but here's a good example to illustrate uh, this whole issue of magnetic. You know, you're seeing more and more manufacturers coming out with magnetic separation technology. And when, when would you even consider that as a designer or, or an installer? Well, here you can see uh, all kinds of piping. You, you have copper. Uh, I can see, you can see um, um, iron piping right there. Uh, you even see PEX going up uh, off those zone valves. Uh, but it's the iron or anything steel related or basically ferrous based type um, components in a hydronic system, including pumps for that matter. The volutes of pumps are oftentimes iron. Yeah. If they're exposed, if there's uh, uh, not a real good job on, on oxygen, dissolved oxygen control, you can get that, like you said, magnetite form. And what you don't yeah. want to have is that getting into your, your pumps or your, in, in this case, perhaps that condensing boiler over there doesn't like it either. You know, right. two areas to be concerned with. Yeah. And that's the, uh, again, that's a function that's built into our SEP4, that magnetic band. Now, these aren't ECM pumps. We, we insist that you put it on an ECM pump. They have magnetic separation, but it's never bad to have that in there because here's another. This is a, probably a cast iron or steel boiler. This is an electric boiler. This is actually a dual boiler system. A lot of times up in Quebec there, they'll use um, uh, electric when the rates are d desirable. And then when the rates go high at peak hours or something like that, they can switch over to natural gas or LP. So that's another big chunk of ferrous metal in the system. So that's where the separator uh, protects all the different components in that picture. So again, nicely piped, nicely wired. It's a nice, uh, we, we appreciate that people, you know, uh, take pride in their work. Like, the, you know, down here, how, how he's lined everything up perfectly and, and has a nice job on the wiring. So Hey Bob, uh, these these PEX lines might be going up to radiant slabs. It's hard to I, I'm not quite sure, but are you seeing uh, in general, as we've seen in the plumbing sector, PEX being more used for just general distribution versus metal-based piping? 
It seems to be. I mean, it, it's, you know, it goes in quicker. It's uh, You can flex it through a lot of places on, on retrofit or new installation. In this job, you can see down here, he does have a little bit of everything. He's got some radiance, some panel rads, and some air handlers in here. So uh, that is a good way to do that. And we do, like I said earlier, we make a connection that could go right onto the zone valve with that PEX. Now he looks like he's probably got some isolation in there, which is never a bad thing. So if someday you had to change the body of a valve, which rarely happens, but it looks like he's gone to a valve and then up to a... Uh, a PEX transition fitting, but I would say that's pretty common, especially running out to radiant manifolds where you might have one in a closet or up in a ceiling or a basement somewhere. Um, I think I still like to use hard piping and I prefer that in the boiler mechanical room just to keep all this piping uh, nice and neat, makes it easy to mount it, keep everything straight and that it's hard to make it look really pretty when you use a PEX tubing to, to do all this near boiler piping. So I, I think you'll always see a, a blend like that of some PEX with some uh, copper iron pipe. And we've seen that pretty much in every slide. It looks like there's a mix and match of anything from steel to copper to, uh, to PEX and that. So uh, Jim uh, is a, a contractor that I know that does a lot of uh, the old gravity conversion systems back in New York there. And uh, this is an example of one that was a gravity conversion. And he's used one of these new Wiesman boilers, which is a, uh, um, it's a high water content boiler. I guess that would be a good way to explain it. So it doesn't need to have um, hydraulic separation. There's no need to have a primary, secondary, or a hydraulic separator on this because this is just a big wide open uh, space inside that boiler. So, you know, there are examples of that out there that not every job uh, needs to have a hydraulic separation. So um, you can see he's come right out of the boiler, right through one of our, our disco air separators and right out to the zones. ECM Bob, is that a condensing there. boiler? Um, I believe it is. It's vented with PVC pipes, so I would say it is. And there's the condensate removal device there. It's just a high, I don't know if I, the right way to describe this, either high mass or high volume. It contains, you can see by the physical size of it, that it's got a bigger uh, boiler than just the little spiral tube ones that we've, we've seen a lot of the little wall hung boilers that you've seen in the previous slide. So, uh, and, and that's what I think if you go read a little bit more about his description on his job, he chose that boiler specifically uh, for that feature that it would be a, a boiler that he could tie right into the, the old big steel piping into this old gravity system and not have to use separation on it. Uh, I see that he is using ECM pumps and I'm glad to see that he did put a magnetic dirt separator. So seeing that he doesn't have a hydraulic separation that does four different uh, functions in one, he's added a good micro bubble uh, separator there, our disco air separator and the dirt separator with the magnetic band across the bottom of it. So he's got all his bases covered here to protect his, uh, his system and his pumps up here with the, with the magnetic function. Uh, one of our relay boxes up there to uh, run the pumps. Nice job, Jim. Uh, <clears throat> this is a job up in Wisconsin. What we like about this is the, the installer that put this together has gone back numerous times and flushed down the magnetic separator to number one, see that it is doing the job that we told him it would do. But he, uh, I think he actually did a video on some of these, didn't he, Mark, when he blew it down and he kept a, a bucket under it so he could see how much debris has come out of this. And I think he's been back there four times now over the, uh, the course of his installation and blow it down. And he said the first time he had you know, a couple inches of this black uh, sediment came out of the system as he blew it down. And the last time he went back uh, and blew it down, he said there's barely any came out. So it proved yeah, to him hey, Bob, that he Bob, wasn't there. Uh, the history on this was it was a large uh, uh, church compound in, in Wisconsin yeah. and uh, yeah. with several different types of zones, radiant, uh, fan yeah. coils, uh, all kinds of different types of tubing. And there wasn't drawings and plans available for uh, access uh, for this contractor who wasn't the original installing contractor. And it's an old installation. So yeah. high efficiency condensing boilers were brought into this. And, um, and because of uh, oxide, ferrous oxide that had built up in the system, uh, even with purging, there was still some remnant uh, uh, ferrous oxide that would continue building up in the system, and those those boilers were going out on uh, low flow, and so that green magnetic separator that you see at the top of the screen was added as uh, as to clean up the job, if you will. And you're right, he did blow it down over a course of a, a few weeks and got the the system cleaned up. Yeah. So that's uh, another excellent application of the. Uh... The magnetic separation even though again he doesn't have ecm pumps that i can see in this drawing these are um you know psc type of motors but uh, certainly we don't want that debris in the uh in the boilers or any of the other you know zone valves or anything else that might be in that system so this was another gravity system uh uh replacement here this one's uh, using a beastman boiler it looks like 
uh, and it does have a hydraulic separator in this picture, same installer as the, the previous one I showed you there with the gravity conversion, Jim, back there in New York. Um, I don't know how he chooses which boiler to use. It looks like he's certainly a Beesman guy, but uh, maybe the space here uh, made it a better fit for this type of boiler, this little wall hung type of boiler as opposed to the bigger one. So you can see one of our um, fill valves there with the gauge on it, hydro separator, air separation there. Um, again, ECM pumps with one of our relay boxes powering up the pump. So it's got it all covered again in a small footprint there. I'd say there's probably what, about four feet of dimension from, uh, you know, where that masonry chimney is, the brick chimney over to where the end of these, this pipe again. So uh, did a nice job shoehorning in. And there's an example of what I spoke about earlier with a uh, an expansion tank that's mounted on its side instead of, uh, um, you know, up or down with the nipple connection there. One thing too, I'll, I'll note in this picture that he's built a bypass around our fill valve. With our quick fill valves, you really don't need to do that. I know some guys like to get that extra flow through there and maybe a you know, 11, 13 gallons a minute, they could get through a half inch ball valve like that to flush out maybe in the old gravity piping and stuff like that. But this is a fast fill valve that um, flows about five gallons a minute. So um, you can see he's got both there. He's got the bypass as well as the fast fill function on the uh, clothy valve. Well, he certainly will increase the, uh, the, the purge with that bypass uh, added to yeah. the uh, autofill. But like you said, in many installations, you, you wouldn't have to do that. But uh, yeah. Sometimes it's uh, it's decided to do it just to speed up the process. Well, and I think guys like it when they're doing these old gravity systems because this house probably has like inch and a half, two inch big size piping. So you want to get a lot of flow through there. You want to get you know 10, 12 gallons a minute through there to blow out any rust and debris when you when you connect these new boilers. In. And maybe that's why he decided to put the uh, you know full flow bypass around it to give them a little bit more purgeability. A lot going on in this picture. This was a job I met these people when I was up in Bozeman last year that did this um, this retrofit. Uh, a couple things I like about the system, they did really nice documentation, system documentation. So you can see he's got some air handlers here. And what he's doing in this job here is actually using the hydro separators on the loop field. So that's its hydraulic uh, isolation between the loop field and the, uh, the heat pumps here. So um, <clears throat> that was a little different application of it there, but all the same functions and features apply to the uh, to the heat pumps here as they would to boilers that he's getting his uh, air, dirt, and hydraulic separation between those devices. You can see it looks like he's got some, uh, I don't know if those are just Y strainers or some flow setters in here, uh, some pumps up there pumping through the various uh, um, heat pumps there, and some buffer tanks down here to buffer those heat pumps. So uh, this was actually, he said, on the entrance to the wine cellar here, you have to go buy the buffer tanks to get into the wine cellar, which is, uh, why they put it in such a nice looking room like that. It's almost like a display room, like uh, the buffer tanks are on display just like the wine is in the wine room and behind it there. So I thought issue number nine probably spoke most to what's going on in this picture here as far as, uh, you know, piping up uh, heat pumps and using buffer tanks to uh, to give you a little bit of a uh, uh, capacity to keep them short cycling the, uh, the heat pumps. And again, nice documentation on that. So thanks to the, the Bozeman group for that. Uh, back in Connecticut, I like this one here. This has got a little bit of everything in it. It's got some uh, geo in it. It's got some uh, uh, backup ModCon boilers, and it also some, has some uh, evacuated tube solar collectors on the roof. So um, this system has a lot of different um, flow rates going into it. So again, um, the hydro separator makes sure that regardless of which heat input or what distribution output's going on, um, he's got it all separated with the uh, hydro separator up there in the corner. For this job, I would say one of our solar issues, probably number six, because this was on combi systems, how you can combine boilers together with solar and heat pumps and different things. So it wouldn't surprise me if some of this piping uh, ideas or schematics and uh, uh, piping schematics might've come right out of some of the ideas that we put in uh, hydronics number six on combi systems like that. <clears throat> what are we looking at for time? All right, let me keep rolling here. Uh, Mike up in... Uh, uh, Ontario, thanks for sending this in. Uh, you can see a, a dual boiler system here. So there's a wood-fired boiler there with a, uh, a ModCon backup boiler on it here, side vented. Um, <clears throat> interesting about this is uh, you can see this fin tube up here, and that fin tube up there with no, uh, uh, probably no heat required in this room, is usually in there for a dump zone for these boilers. So if this boiler was running and the power went out and there's no way to shut the fire off instantly, uh, a lot of these boilers you see piped in with this uh, bunch of fin tube up high like that so they've got a little gravity circulation through that to keep that boiler from overheating until the, the power comes back on and they can uh, 
ramp down the get the pump going again and also ramp down the uh, inducer fan that are on those boilers so uh, what else can I show you? This is kind of a small picture. It looks like he's got a dirt separator on the bottom there, a mag separator, one of our um, dirt mags with the magnetic band on it there. Um, hard to see down there, but I'm assuming there's some separation and some air separation uh, down at the bottom where he's tied the two different boilers in together. I think of all the tight space installations that I'm showing you here, this is probably the tightest. This to me looks like it used to be a storage closet because he's got the, uh, looks like the brackets for some shelves that were probably across in here at one point. And they said, well, that's the only place we can put in the, uh, a boiler. Can you squeeze it in here? And he's done an excellent job of doing exactly that. So you can see he's got his boiler up here. And this is a domestic hot water module for the boiler. Uh, in this version of the Beastman, they don't have the combi built into it. So inside here, I think it's a flat plate heat exchanger. So you can see domestic water coming in here, getting heated and going back out. So in this, let's call this three feet of space, I would guess, on this drawing, just by knowing the size of these components. He's got his boiler. He's got his domestic water. He's got his hydraulic separation, his distribution pumping, expansion tank is filled, uh, nice uh, fill and purge valves here in a couple spots, an additional air vent here to make sure that the uh, uh, they call this box. I don't know if they have a name for this uh, manifold or this uh, heat exchanger box that he's got in there. It has a little bit of air removal here, and also he's got the air removal in his hydraulic separator. So there's uh, doesn't get any better than that as far as getting it all in a lot of uh, a lot of eggs in one basket, so to speak. <clears throat> what else can I tell you about that? Uh, again, uh, an, an entry from back in. April 15 is when this one was sent in to us. Ah, a lot of iron there. I hope the scrap prices are up high when he did this job. This is a friend of ours, Kurt, up in uh, Minnesota. This was a church job, and this was interesting. This was a big church, and somebody had gone in there and taken out the old, I believe they were cast iron boilers, and retrofit some ModCon boilers into that, but the system never worked properly. They couldn't get a good handle on the temperature in different areas of the church, and they were having all sorts of air and noise problems. So. Kurt came in and basically did this, just start all over. The other guy just put the boilers into the existing piping and system pumping and just didn't have a good hand on it. So Kurt knew that he needed hydraulic separation to make sure that the boilers and the pumps got along well. You can see he's got a row of uh, ECM pumps there on the wall, hydro separator just out of the bottom of the picture there, and just cleaned up all the piping on it to make sure that he got flow through the boiler so he didn't have lockouts on the boiler. He solved all the heating problems in the various rooms because he gave him zone pumps that were, you know, modulated or uh, adjusted to the load in each one of those different uh, uh, areas of the church that this serves. So this was a big win. Uh, he told me the fuel consumption, even though the fuel consumption went down a little bit from the original uh, change from cast iron to the, uh, the mod comp, he said it got even better when they sorted out some of the uh, incorrect distribution piping and put some better air removal into it and made the system just that much more efficient by just, you know, paying attention to the details, you know, using all the information that we've given you on piping and making sure that you've got a good micro bubble uh, removal in these systems to, to get rid of those uh, noise problems, especially when you've got piping that could go, you know, hundreds of feet down the, you know, mechanical room or something to get to different areas of that building you got to have excellent air removal you'll be chasing that air at the radiators for the rest of your life uh, <clears throat> another one of our canadian jobs here what i like about this job is it shows some of our uh, uh, three-way mixing valve thermostatic mixing valve so what he's done on this job is use these are uh looks like the b and g burial pumps i think those are also ecm pumps this is a pump that you can actually I think it's got about a nine speed selection switch on it. So what he's been able to do here is he's mixed down the temperature to all these different zones, uh, different zones going out there and he can also adjust the pump speed. So what I like about this picture is, is I'm thinking he was aware that the CV of these typical uh, three quarter one inch mixing valves is you know, maybe a three CV valve. So there's no way you could have put one valve on this job and expected to feed this many zones going out to it for one. So he was aware of the pressure drop going through that valve and he chose to use multiple thermostatic mixing valves even though some of these are requiring the same temperature he's made sure that he's not starving into this uh, distribution for flow uh, by going through a you know a mixing valve and then you can see in addition to uh, the pumps here some of the uh, zones also had zone valves so he was able to tie the pumps in with the zone valves with the, the, the ECM type of pumping and really get the best of everything in this in this picture here that he's got the ability to uh, uh, adjust all the individual temperatures as well as the uh, flow rate on the pump and just really balance the system out with a you know a pretty minimal amount of components to do that 
And another example of where, um, you know, this distribution going out could have been PEX tubing right off of the top if he's going to remote manifolds on that. I thought the one, again, that we did on zoning kind of answers uh, some of the, you know, information that you might want to have on on selecting these here. Hey, Bob. And again, a good example. Yep. Yeah, this is um, uh, on the left hand side. He's uh, obviously zoning with the, uh, the the variable speed circulators coming off of the yeah. thermostatic mixing valves. On, on his last zone there, which is on the right, he's got his pump subdivided into further zones by zone valves. And sometimes, yeah. from a control standpoint, this can be a little bit tricky. So I wanted to point out that the we don't have it in this photograph, but uh, the Cleffy uh, zone valve relay uh, is, in this case, would be um, daisy chained uh, attached to the zone mm -hmm. valve zone pump relay. They work in tandem. Uh, basically, you yeah. can daisy chain them and do basically sub subzoning. So primary zoning with the circulators and subzoning with the uh, uh, with the uh, zone valves, all as part one um, installation, one design. Yeah. And that was one of the criteria that when we uh, set out to make relay boxes, that was something that the uh, installers, the feedback that we got from the field saying, make it easy. So when we do these systems, where we've got pumps and zone valves that are going to be working together, that you give us enough features in the box that, you know, that we can make those all communicate and work together with one another. So we did exactly that. And uh, you'll see in some of these drawings where you'll have multiple boxes on the wall that we might be doing some zone valves and some pumping. So, um, California job, always a challenge in California that they get wide temperature swings in some of these jobs. So in this case here, this system um, is uh, both a heating and cooling via the slab, and there's also some air handlers in here too. So um, a lot of the same things that you see in previous jobs here, some of our zone valves, uh, ECM pump there for the multiple zones in the job, uh, another ECM pump over here, uh, some slab uh, zones going down there, uh, indirect tank for the uh, domestic water. I know some of those, these are pretty small pictures to see some of the detail in there, Temp, uh, pressure gauge there. So there you can see uh, multiple uh, relays on the wall there. Look, some, some set point controllers maybe for the, the cooling function of it. And uh, hydronics, we did an issue on hydronic cooling uh, a couple years ago. What was that back in 13, I think? Uh, it looks like it was in 13 that we did number 13, issue number 13 on hydronic cooling. We're seeing more and more of that. Uh, some of it's chill beam, some of it's in slab. Of course, anybody that works with that knows to be aware of uh, dew point conditions if you're going to try and do radiant slab cooling, for example. So um, uh, this one here, Eric Ani, thanks for sending this. And I like this. All he did with this job is go in and clean it up. You know, this was a job. This is what it looked like when he walked into it. And he told the people, you know, troubleshooting this job or working on this is just ridiculous. All these wires and connections were loose and the zone. Zone valves would work some days, some days they weren't getting zones that were opening, so he just went in and just cleaned it up with some of our uh, Z1 zone valves. And here's uh, an example where he uh, embraced our, our press connections on our zone valves. So you see you went to press connection. Now you might say, well, he could have gone right to PEX, but what he's done here is he's put isolation valves above these uh, zone valves, and there's probably one on the main trunk down here. So he can isolate both sides of these zone valves if down the road, for whatever reason, uh, one of the actuators had to be rebuilt or removed or something like that. You can isolate it here, and then he transitioned to the uh, uh, the PEX tubing there. And what he did also is he put, a, it looks like he did this with a Siggy's Hydronic CAD drawing program. He put a little schematic of, uh, you know, how the system is, uh, how it was piped and stuff like that for somebody else that might have to work on it. So just a nice cleanup job. So some of the entries that we get sent to us, you know, we're not looking necessarily for all big trophy homes or big expensive commercial jobs. I mean, that was just a, you know, the case of going in and replacing some zone valves with the uh, with the Cluffy Z1 and cleaning up some wiring and piping. So, um, and another new construction. This is a condo project here with multiple boilers. Again, you can see all the uh, same functions here with the uh, magnetic driven uh, ECM pumps, uh, various zone pumps out here, uh, indirect tank over here. Uh, looks like he's got two fill systems. That's interesting that he's got two different fill systems for the two different boilers there. Um, I'm assuming if they're piped together, it's all one fluid, but he is a pipe to that. There you'll see one of our discal air separators in this picture here. Um, so it looks like a little bit of in-floor, a little bit of air handler, domestic hot water, kind of a nice uh, combination of components. Now here's an example of somebody who had a lot of uh, room to put all this stuff together. Of course, it looks like a fisheye view of it with a with the camera, but certainly uh, he had room to spread out a little bit here and uh, you know give him a little bit of room for piping, getting all those components in without the uh, you have to stand in the closet sideways to work on it like some of those previous ones. 
Now this is interesting here in this job that um, what he's done is he's put our air and dirt separator right together with one another and just flange to flange them together like that. Um, we do make a combination device, which is what I showed in this picture over here to the right, that would be both of these in one uh, component that would have taken out, you know, some of the distance required here, some of the, uh, um, have to buy two components. Number one, you could have put a, uh, a combination air and dirt separator in there also. So we do have individuals as well as the, uh, you know, combi units. Bob, do we have time for our last poll? I think that might have been my, yeah, we do. Good timing. That was my last slide. But go okay. ahead. If you got another poll, let's do that. And then we'll, we'll wrap up with some questions. And Well, you're talking about magnetic separation. So uh, maybe to get an idea from the folks out there uh, about their, whether they use or don't use magnetic separation devices, whether it's a dirt separator or a hydraulic separator that has that function or a combination device. So I'm going yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna to launch this. Okay. So the question is, when do you include a magnetic separation device of any type on installations that contain an ECM circulator, electronically commutated motor type high efficiency circulator? So um, on your designs or your installations, uh, always, if you have an ECM circulator, or only if the job is a retrofit, or if you have experience it's already some circulator problem and therefore you need to protect that pump or just in general sometimes or never and uh, it looks like uh, always uh, 30 some percent by far and then sometimes Bob uh, and then yeah. and then um, and then uh, if the job is a retrofit um, sometimes and um, and, and not so much if the circulator experiences problems. So people aren't waiting for a problem, basically. They're uh, yeah. either doing it based on the design or not. And I got to tell you, I was out in Northern California, what is it, two weeks ago now with uh, our rep out there who happens to be a pump rep also. And he said, uh, the wholesaler that we're training at, they said every one of their jobs that goes out with an ECM pump just has right in the quote, has a magnetic separation function because they are seeing issues with that and it, which comes back as a warranty claim of course to the wholesaler and of course the uh, rep and then on to the manufacturer so saying you know we'd almost give everybody a magnetic separator at our cost just to make sure it protects you know the pumps in there because it's uh, everybody gets that call back the contractor the wholesaler the uh, uh the rep and the manufacturer get uh, involved in a in a warranty claim on a pump that failed because of a, a magnetic particle that was pulled in there so if you haven't embraced that now's the time to start thinking about uh uh, magnetic separation, especially when you're using the uh, electronic pump. So um, I don't know if there's a couple questions. I guess we're right at the time here, but we could hit a couple questions if uh, if there's something, Mark, that jumps out at you. If not, um, I'll get back to the ones that you sent in if, if they didn't get answers through the course. It looks like we had over 250 people here today. That was a great yeah. turnout. Thanks, everybody. But hey, I'll hey, Bob, I'll tell your questions. It was a good point yeah. that came in from England, uh, from Christopher uh, Flaherty. Um, you know, in England, uh, the practice with um, magnetic filters is, is really um, uh, on, to protect the boiler on the return. And, um, mm -hmm. and not so much, for, the, the pump really doesn't drive the decision. And I'd say the same thing holds true here. We, we asked the question when your system contains an electronically commutated motor type circulator, but his point's well taken. Uh, today's mm, high efficiency condensing boilers are part of the system that have very close passages and as therefore susceptible to the buildup of debris and iron oxide and then cause uh, the big problems like we showed uh, in that commercial job in, um, in Wisconsin. So it isn't just ECM pumps, uh, the use of that you'd want to consider magnetic separation. It's these other, call it uh, susceptible and somewhat expensive uh, components. And I think all the boiler guys out there that are listening probably would agree to that you know, because of the warranty issues that can come to play when you have a, a boiler, whether it's a big commercial, a million BTU type uh, boiler or a uh, 100,000 BTU. It's the same issue that could happen is that that iron oxide builds up and uh, and cause a problem. So, well, and that's true of every component. I mean, some of the pressure independent balancing valves have very small passageways in them. So, anything that we can do to additionally, you know, get dirt out of the system, whether it's a magnetic separator, or, uh, you know, one of our our dirt cows, certainly uh, we want to see that uh, that type of device. It doesn't add that much cost over a regular dirt separator to have a, a magnetic function uh, uh, included with it. So, 
uh, yeah, there's no harm in using it on any system, certainly on those old iron pipe systems that have a lot of value, uh, whether you're using the ECM pump or not, because we don't want that stuff in our zone valves, our balancing valves, our pumps, our boilers. We don't want it anywhere, really. <laughs> we want it out of the system, and that's that's what we're trying to help you do is uh, a quick and easy way of doing that by just pulling a magnet out and uh, and flushing it out. So, yep. Um, you got any other questions or you want to call it a day here? Yeah, I think we've been answering them as we've gone and uh, sharing them. So uh, good questions that came in. I think it struck a chord. So uh, I think that's the end of the questions for now. And those that we don't haven't gotten to, uh, that come in afterwards, we'll get to individually. So, so Bob, back to you. Yeah, well, thanks. And hi to Scott and some of the people I know on the list. There. I see a lot of my friends that have tuned in today. And uh, uh, definitely come back for Siggy next month and then for uh, uh, Jody and Jerry. Um, on the boiler one in August. So I guess I would say thanks to everybody and thanks again for thinking Kalefi and we'll see you in a, uh, a month or so. Have a good summer. Bye-bye.